the, recording you know, in progress. I, obviously, I think we all kind of got exhausted by lives after COVID or whatever, but <clears throat> when big stuff happens, there's a future there uh, to, you know, providing live analysis. And you see that on Twitch and on YouTube, you know, with some people who are, by the way, bringing in millions of dollars a year doing live news streams. And I'm going to learn it with you. You know, literally, you're watching them peruse websites as like stories are breaking. Millions. In terms of revenue. Yeah. Twitch. Yeah. Twitch is making a push there. Sure, sure, sure. Hey, everybody. Wow. Got about 13 people. Uh, now 14 in the attendance audience here. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Hey, all. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just jump right in. Uh, you know, we, we have like uh, four hours worth of material. So we have uh, <laughs> an hour on the calendar and I'd like to actually go under that. So uh, better to get started uh, rather than wait. Uh, my name is Rakesh. I'm the founder and CEO of Snapstream where our <clears throat> mission is to help our customers harness the power of moments. And uh, I'm, I'm joined here today in our first, uh, first as a part of the Snapstream live series where we interview um, you know, customers and influencers in the uh, the news and the media space. Um, but I'm joined here today by our first guest, uh, Mosh uh, Wanunu. Did I did I did I pronounce it correctly? You Mosh? you got it, Rakesh. Yes, uh, somebody who's always had their name mispronounced. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> the few, but, the uh, proud. Yes. So Mosh, thank you for joining us. Your our, your title is uh, founder of Mo News. What what are you uh, chief cook and bottle washer? What's you know the, when you start title? your own when you start your own company, it's always you're like what what title am I giving myself? Uh, but but founder and, and editor in chief is is what I go with here as we um, uh, continue to expand to multiple multiple media platforms. Yeah. Um, well, awesome. Welcome. Thank you for uh, thank you for being here. And I'm looking forward to digging in on, into a lot of different uh, subjects. Uh, you're uh, I, I really do think about you as a as a founder. And uh, um, I think you know this about me, but and uh, maybe some people in the audience know this, but I'm an investor in a bunch of early stage, um, mostly software companies, but early stage companies. But I've been a student of entrepreneurship and innovation and disruption for for many years and uh, uh, whether it's like a founder as a founder of snapstream or an investor in these other early stage companies so that's really how I how I look at um, you and and mo news um, love what you what you've built um, I would love to have you start by giving us the origin story of the of mo news um, I've, I've Heard a little bit of it before the pandemic, first time in your living room versus the versus the newsroom, and so you know, of course, uh, share with everyone your background as well. But uh, that that'd be a great starting point. Tell tell me how this thing got started. So I, you go back to the beginning. I've always been obsessed with media and news from a from a very young age. Uh, was actually visiting my parents in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, a couple of days ago, and my mom kept as some others do, keep all my projects. And I wrote an essay in fourth grade saying I would be an anchorman <clears throat> one day. So this started early for me, uh, spent uh, a couple decades uh, at a number of national media uh, organizations, uh, Fox News, Bloomberg Television, and CBS News. And so for me, Mo News is, is a product of my experiences there and lessons learned there. Uh, took a break from it, uh, wanted a break from daily news. And then nine months, later, uh, so the summer 2019, spring 2020, the pandemic hits. Uh, and, uh, you know, we all found ourselves uh, quarantined uh, to a certain extent. And I found myself getting questions from friends and family, you know, break down what's happening here. Like, this is really, you know, a scary situation. And I found myself utilizing the skills that I picked up in various newsrooms, which is like, how do I synthesize data? Who are the trustworthy um, people uh, reporting things out? Uh, what are the questions we should be asking? How do we separate the politics from the facts at the time? Um, and found myself, like many people, uh, frustrated by what I was seeing, confused as to where to turn to. And so I, at that moment, uh, found that I had uh, 500 or so friends and family on my Instagram account. Mm -hmm. I liked that on Instagram stories, uh, it's the last place in social media where you can Put together a chronological story and not an algorithmic story and so i felt like that was my best you know of course you could thread on twitter or whatever but i also found twitter just not be a place i wanted to do news it was oversaturated it's overly negative and instagram felt like the place i could communicate with friends and family 
anyway, so I start doing that and watching Fauci briefings and watching Cuomo and watching Trump and reading stat news and the Financial Times and trying to find things. And uh, my wife comes to me and was like, you should open up your account. It was a private account. I was like, for what? She's like, I think other people would find this useful. Okay, let's see. And suddenly, you know, it started to grow in this first few weeks of the pandemic and several thousand people started following me and then some celebrities started following me. And then a, a few weeks in Joe Jonas tells everyone, Joe Jonas, like the singer from the Jonas Brothers, finds me and tells everyone, you got to follow this guy. I'm like, whoa, I've tapped into something. And what I thought was an exercise in uh, effectively keeping myself busy and informing friends and family, I realized tap into something greater, which is people's need for information, trustworthy information, the abject lack of trust that exists for major organizations, and a larger feeling that we've entered this uh, creator influencer world where people want to feel like they're getting lifestyle tips or beauty tips or nutrition tips or travel tips, or in this case, the news from somebody individual that they trust. Yeah. Um, yeah, tell me about the trust because I we, we talked about this before, um, you know, before our before this interview, uh, that's I mean, it sounds like that's really the the crux of the product that you offer is uh, is is providing people with a with a trustworthy source. And you've scaled that to what's your audience now? Um, We're daily, about a half million people between podcast, newsletter and uh, Instagram. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, this is this is something I think. I feel like it's at the core of what you what you do is uh, is establishing this trust. How do you how do you do that? Um, there's a few ways we approach it. Um, number one, I make a point, and it's hard, right? But uh, of you are going to get nonpartisan news. You are we are going to try our best in the year twenty. Well, it was twenty twenty. Now it's twenty twenty three, to provide you with just the facts where we'll also call BS on lies, but at the end of the day, we will make a point of providing, um, you know, the information that we think is important for you to make a decision about what's happening. That's item one. Item two, we're transparent about what we don't know. Um, and I think, and you know, I'll admit during my time working at various media organizations, we felt like we felt obligated to make people know that we have a command for everything that's going on. We will tell you what's happening. When in fact, I think it does help with trust to say, you know what, we don't actually know what's going on. And I think that's one of the lessons from those early stages of COVID, Rakesh, whether we talk about the mask situation, you don't need masks, you do need masks, you do, you know, the vaccine's going <clears> to <throat> prevent spreading, uh, but actually it didn't actually, you know, um, uh, you know, lessen the contagion. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that uh, would come out later that then leads the consumer to say, well, they told me X and the truth turned out to be Y. So now why can I trust them on anything else they say? And that's the problem we have is we're kind of in this post-truth society. So transparency about what we don't know and we do know is important. And I think one other key aspect to uh, trust Rakesh is that we uh, make a genuine attempt to answer people's questions, no matter what the question is, no matter whether it's how many justices are there in the Supreme Court, or why, you know, like what's the deal with primary elections? You know, stuff that you may you might have learned in junior high civics or high school civics, but you know, you live life, you have families, you have a job, you have a variety of things. You know, you, you don't restudy your social studies book from high school. So I'm not here to judge, I'm here to answer. And frankly, we allow in many cases on a daily basis, the, the consumer, the audience to help dictate what we're covering. What are you guys interested in? What are you mm. seeing? And in many cases, I'll see stories bubbling up. I mean, one good example recently was the, the Sound of Freedom movie, movie hmm. um, about child trafficking, which wasn't garnering much attention outside of the conservative media. Um, but I was getting a dozen questions a day uh, when it came out. And it hmm. took a couple of weeks before the mainstream media picked up on it. And so I just feel like staying close to the audience and figuring out what they're interested in um, is one avenue to ensuring, you know what, I trust this media outlet. They seem to be responsive to the types of questions and the issues we care about. Um, what's, what have been the inflection points in the growth of that audience? You're at 500,000 now across all these different channels. Um, you know, can, you, can you point at uh, events or you know, developments in, in your offering? Uh, you know, that have represented like greater, greater jumps in that in that audience size that have kind of like taken you to the next level? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it really has revolved around an, a handful of major news stories. So there's early COVID, those first couple of months of COVID, stage one. Uh, Black Lives Matter, summer of 2020, stage two. Um, the election, uh, you know, uh, the final couple of weeks before the election, the election aftermath in January 6th would, would be another inflection point. Um, then uh, the Israeli-Gaza war of May 2021, it's interesting, I'm kind of going through chronology here, chronology. A huge one was the withdrawal from Afghanistan in August of 2021. The feeling mm -hmm. that again, uh, you know, that's where um, I thought that our format uh, is effective in telling people the story because it wasn't always what's happening now. It's like, there's actually a 5,000 year history of Western countries trying to invade Afghanistan. So it's like, wait, remind me who the Taliban is? Why are we there again? Like, what's the deal with X, Y, and Z? Um, and I got a huge influx of audience uh, from military families that were genuinely concerned mm -hmm. about what was happening there, including, and this was fascinating, veterans that were trying to get their interpreters out. And so what happened, Rakesh, is that- Oh, I, was, I saw that, yeah. I was hearing from people, like I got seven people trying to make it to the airport. And I'm like, well, based on the latest BBC and Sky News reports, it appears the North Gate is closed and the South Gate's open right now. Oh, thank you. And then I was being let in on WhatsApp groups where they were showing me how they were trying to get people out. Uh, and mm. so that's where the kind of unique nature of being in touch with your audience really allowed you to get, you know, stay close to the ground and both what was happening there and what was happening here. And then I was finding that, you know, anonymous embassy officials from various countries were letting me in on, on what was happening. So I felt like I had a real time access to what was happening. So that was a huge moment. The beginning of the Ukraine war, the invasion uh, by Russia, uh, was a, another huge moment. And incidentally, um, not as, uh, you know, uh, not international conflict by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, the most recent, the Southwest Airlines fiasco of last winter. Um, you know, again, I felt like I was hearing from people that uh, about that really early on and giving people real time uh, uh, information about that uh, was also uh, interestingly, um, a story that was very closely followed and brought in a, a, a good audience to us. Uh, yeah, really interesting. So then, you know, essentially there are these crucible moments that have occurred in, in you know, global news, and those have been the sources of influx. Uh, and, you know, and maybe, maybe those are moments of like greater, greater complexity, uh, for example. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in ex I think I like to say is that the the news, you know, has always been going and you tune in in the middle of a movie, in the middle of a TV show. Uh, mm. And as journalists, we take for granted because we've been living it every day that you've been living it every day. And you're like, actually, yeah. I haven't. I have not checked in on Afghanistan or Iraq. You know, like people will still ask me, like, we have soldiers in Iraq. I was like, we do. It's 20 years later. Why? Well, let me tell you a good example today. You know, the, the, the latest ISIS leader was killed again. I think it's their fifth leader in five years. Mm. Wait, there's still ISIS? Well, let me explain to you what ISIS is today. Uh, and the fact that there's at least a thousand US troops still in Syria fighting ISIS after years after we declared victory over them. Um, and so people want that background, that context. And that's where, you know, the nature of television having produced television, you only have a certain number of minutes or seconds to tell a story. And so you're not able to provide that context, that history, answer those questions, provide that background. Um, and so I think that there's something to the Instagram format and frankly, social media itself. I, you know, I'm not gonna limit it to Instagram, whether it's TikTok or Twitter, or I guess, what do we have threads now? Um, there are ways that social media is, a, is uniquely capable of being able to provide, answer all those types of questions that update you on the first half of the movie. Yeah, uh, you, you almost, almost uh, what, you, what you talk about almost points at the need for like, um, like a video Wikipedia, which provides background information, right? Where you could say, oh, like, hey, wait, before I like listen to this story or watch this story on ISIS, like, give me like the 30 second, 60 second backgrounder. We all do this today where yeah. like, we don't know something, we don't have a piece of background information. And it's often, it's not exclusively Wikipedia, but it's like often Wikipedia, right? But in a, vid in a visual context, how can we get that kind of like, you know, up to date, quick background? Yeah, I mean, it's almost like Cora tried to be that, right? Uh, if I'm really dating myself, remember askjeeves.com back oh, in the yeah. early internet days. Um, interestingly, Rakesh, you know, that's the way that many people, uh, especially Gen Z is using TikTok, right? They're right. using TikTok yeah. uh, as effectively video Wikipedia. The unfortunate thing is 
I guess the fortunate and unfortunate thing is there are no gatekeepers. That's the greatest part here. There is no longer gatekeepers. The worst yeah. part is there are no longer gatekeepers. So, you know, oftentimes on a daily basis, the questions I'm getting involve sending me a link to a video that somebody's watched being like, is this true? 75% of the time it's not, <laughs> but yeah. it really depends. Um, but that's the thing is we are in this kind of wild, wild west of information. And this speaks to the lack of trust in media institutions, but also the stories that they're covering that aren't necessarily um, plugged into what people are genuinely concerned about. The media is not always answering all the questions uh, or some of the, even some of the biggest questions people have. And so that's what is leading people to seek out alternatives. Um, and so, you know, Wikipedia, you know, is this great encyclopedia, uh, but, and actually I think it's gotten much better through the years with more people involved in it, et cetera. But, uh, cause I remember there was a time 20 years ago that like Wikipedia was a complete whatever, but, you know, at the same time, if you throw a question about ISIS or, you know, uh, the airlines or Ukraine or whatever into TikTok, you know, what are you going to get? You don't know. What are you going to so, get? Are you, you going to get something from the BBC? <laughs> are you going to get the BBCCC? Which, you know, some people are like, have you seen this story? I'm like, that's a made up outlet. Have you ever heard of like USA News right. with three S's before? Like, that's yeah, not yeah, a yeah. thing. Yeah, no, I have I have young adult kids and uh, or one young adult kid. And uh, and like we have this conversation all the time or we it, we had it a long time ago. Like our my kids have, I think, pretty good pretty decent uh hygiene when it comes to like what's the source on that is it a, is it a is it a credible source should i question this should i find a more credible source all of that right I, like that by the way i like your use of the word hygiene there i haven't heard that in the in the news context before yeah 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 um so going back to the audience i i, I also like i think that's one of the most innovative things that you do is you almost co-create your 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 program with your audience right you have this two-way fully participatory thing uh going with your audience i mean we have this webinar going there's a there's a chat uh i haven't seen uh what if there are any questions yet no it doesn't look like there are yet but uh but you know you're constantly fielding questions i mean you're you're also like in some cases, it sounds like helping, uh, you know, navigate traffic on the ground in a crisis, um, <laughs> which is which is which is kind of crazy. But um, I'm I'm curious, like how that's developed, right? Like you started out with 500 people, and you'd answer questions as they came in on you know all these various channels. Uh, now you're at 500,000. What's what's been the evolution of that interactivity with people? Has it you know taken any kind of formal formal shape? Uh, you know, have you enlisted some of your audience to be in like a tier above the the regular tier? Um, are any of them like, you know, uh, curators for you where you've identified that, oh, hey, these audience members are, you know, are, are, are greater news junkies. And so I can rely on them to help me create the program. I'm just curious how that relationship is involved with your audience. I actually say that I actually think that's a great idea, Rakesh. You kind of, it's kind of the Wikipedia model, right? Like elevating editors or whatever. What's interesting is, you know, as we've evolved this, one of the things, uh, you know, I had to make a decision on is like, is this going to be a business? Is this going to be my profession? Or, or am I going to return to, you know, network news or consulting or you know, the stuff I was doing on the side? And, you know, once I saw we, you know, we put up a Patreon page in the fall of 2020. So about six months in being like, hey, if you like what we're doing and you want me to continue it, you know, subscribe to Patreon, monthly, annual, etc. And several hundred people immediately did that. I was like, oh, th I mean, I guess there could be something here um, mm -hmm. in terms of monetization. So we made a concerted effort, like let's figure out how to monetize. Um, one of the things that you know we made a decision on is we got to move beyond Instagram and, and do a podcast uh, and do a newsletter, which are much more advanced ecosystems when it comes to uh, advertising and sponsorships. Um, it's a challenge to do monetized news on Instagram. It just doesn't lend itself to, to as many partners as you get in the lifestyle space. One thing that we launched recently, speaking to your question about tiers, is uh, premium, what we call Mo News Premium. So that enables folks to, uh, based on a monthly or annual fee, they get access to a members only Instagram. And that's where I'm interacting daily with people, answering a couple dozen questions a day, you know, everything from. You know anything that is on people's mind you know what's up with that you know shady cdc discovered lab in california to you know does mike pence have a chance to 
whatever's on the top of people's minds. And they'll also then get access to extra podcast editions, early access, et cetera. So we've created a tier of people. Uh, mm -hmm. And these, again, are the people probably who, you know, uh, have been plugged in for a while, really like what we're doing. Um, I trust to be able to have a sensible, civil conversation, which is challenging on social media. I mean, what's crazy in the last couple of years, I think most media organizations have cut out their comments uh, opportunity to comment on stories because like of the direction those comments go and frankly, the liability sure. that uh, it could lead to. And so um, we've created a premium tier. Um, and so like many media companies, we're trying to balance like, okay, what are we gonna do in terms of advertising and partnerships? And what can we do in terms of subscriptions uh, mm -hmm. for, for a group? But I think what's important to me is I don't want to paywall off all my content because that's at cross purposes with my general goal, which is like, I want people to have good information uh, on a basic level and it should be available for free. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the monetization is basically, there are two components to it. There's sponsorship and then now this uh, subscription revenue. Is that is that right? Those are the yes. two, two components. And you had uh, sponsorships advertising essentially, you know, before you turned on this subscription uh, model. And so uh, how's it going? How's the, how's, how is Mo News as a business going? It's going, it's uh, month over month, we continue to grow. Um, I'm very ambitious. We're very ambitious here. And so we want to continue to grow it. And the one thing we want to do is make it sustainable. Uh, and, uh, you know, the advertising market is what it is. So to the extent that we can get some sort of um, tent pole sponsors and partners, that would be ideal. Um, you know, I, I spent almost a decade at CBS News. And one of the things that we did, especially as we were launching the streaming platform, was try to look back at the archives and figure out what content through the years could we leverage. And what was remarkable to me is, you know, sort of the media goes in cycles. And we're sort of at the same stage now that sort of like early TV was. Like this entire episode brought to you by Virginia Slims and, you know, the Edward R. Murrow, like smoking a cigarette or whatever. Um, I'm not taking any tobacco advertising, but that, by that, I mean, like, it'd be great to like, you know, Virginia Slims, like brought to you, you know, Mo News brought to you by X. And so then you can rest assured you have one big sponsor. They stay out of your editorial matters and then you can move ahead, uh, you know, with your content and, and grow. And I think, you know, a big question for any entrepreneur and you know, this, any startup is like, do you take outside money? And at this, at this point, you know, I'm bootstrapping it uh, as we continue to see growth. And we've seen really incredible growth on the subscription front in the first 90 days. Uh, and so then the question is, what can we do uh, to continue to grow that? Because we have sort of the, the initial group that has come in who very much want to support us. And, so, and some of them even like, I want to support you. I'll give you money. I don't care if you give me anything in return. And then you hit the stage of like, okay, what about the rest of the consumers out there? What are the things behind the wall that won't limit your overall growth on the free platforms, but yep. will incent people uh, to come aboard and subscribe. And you know, you've seen this like if you follow various media companies, like the New York Times has tried many different. You know, every publication has like, do we put our opinion behind the paywall? Do we put X behind the paywall? And I think that's a constant challenge for any media company, which is what to make free and available, what free, and yep. what freemium model to really have. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, and you know, when you when you launch recipes, like that's going to be the real money maker, right? Um, <laughs> as I understand, it is at the New York Times. My wife is an incredible cook uh, with great recipes, actually. So maybe there's. I mean, listen, I think that one of the things you discover in media, uh, even if you look at the kind of unique models at Axios and the Washington Post, is as you figure out your revenue pie, uh, what ends up bringing in certain revenue might not be traditional content or media at all, but some sort of offshoot, some sort of service you can provide that helps um, then pay for the editorial. Sure. Yeah. So like you mentioned that the premium offering today is this private Instagram channel. By the way, I'm a subscriber as of yesterday. Thank um, you very much. Yeah. Um, but uh, you have this private Instagram channel um, and uh, what else was there? There's their uh, early it's, access to the podcast. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a, and it's a members only podcast. So exclusive episodes members and early only. access. Yep. And early access. So what, what, what do you see potentially adding to that in the, in terms of the premium offering? So one of the things that we do is we'll also, you know, do kind of deep dive um, 
uh, stories on you know various topics. So here, like actually funny, somebody said, I have a challenge for you. Do the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict over the last 5,000 years. And I was like, okay, we'll do it on premium. Challenge accepted. So I think over like 52 slides, I presented, you know, from the Phoenicians to, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu. And, uh, and so we make that available in highlights on the Instagram channel. One of the goals, we're continuing to build out the Mo News website right now. And we see that mm. as a place where we'll be able to provide those deep dives. Uh, and one of the mm. other things that's been requested and we're looking into is also putting together courses for people. So, mm. you know, I, you know uh, and so ultimately making those courses available on the Mo News website uh, as a premium offering, which is explaining the Supreme Court, explaining the history of Russia and Ukraine, uh, uh, you know, various topics that we think are relevant and provide you uh, what you need to know. And so sort of masterclass for news topics. What, what, are, what are some things that you've tried that have failed in the, in, in the course of building Mo News? <sighs> You know, we, right. I mean, because you, as as a as a founder, you go down some blind alleys that you know don't yield you anything, right? You conduct experiments that fail, that you learn from, and lead to the thing that succeeds. You know, one of the things is just learning to evolve the platform. I think that I've I have probably seen uh, growth that hasn't. My growth has been limited by um, not pivoting quick enough. So for example, this mm. whole thing began by posting a whole bunch of stories on Instagram. The thing about Instagram stories is they're not widely shareable. You can't just click and share them to everybody. So I probably, but in the height of COVID, stories made sense because the story was evolving minute by minute. So I think I stuck to that format, devoting a lot of time and effort to creating stories that were not eminently shareable, uh, and mm -hmm. ultimately thereby limiting my growth and, and reach. So I think, um, you know, pivoting to more permanent posts, you know, reels, doing as more on camera stuff. You know, I think one of the things you learn in social media as a creator is you have to play to where the platform is going and pivot to that. Um, so I think, you know, that was one thing uh, is just, you know, embracing on camera, et cetera. I would say, you know, I'm probably belatedly trying to grow TikTok presence, which also requires a lot of video. Now, interestingly, Instagram much more reliable than TikTok, but TikTok has a much higher ceiling than Instagram. So I could put the same video out. I could put you know, five videos out. I know on Instagram about how many views I'm gonna get on each one. On TikTok, literally one video could get 52 views and the next one could get 4.2 million. And it's blind, but what it the 4.2 million, suddenly you have a few thousand more people who follow you. So you have to sort of throw the darts in the TikTok world. So I yeah. think that, um, you know, I, I would say that, you know, my biggest mistakes were probably just not embracing podcasts early enough, uh, not pivoting the nature of the Instagram content quick enough. Um, and uh, what are some other things that I tried and failed? You know, I think that even my early Patreon experiment, right, like uh, mm. not embracing that subscription you know because i my assumption my default was that like i'm going to be and i know everyone's different but like i'm going to be vast majority partnerships advertising i called it 90 10. i'll be 90 percent advertising 10 percent subscription and i think that i've realized over time if you can build a good loyal group of subscribers at a certain you know a, amount you can actually build the business that way in a sustainable way that isn't contingent on a a contract with X corporation for three more months and, you know, holding out hope that that gets extended. Yeah. I want to go back to something you, you said you left traditional news. You were, you were uh, pretty senior at CBS news, right? And you said you were taking a break for nine months. Had you done that before? And what, what were you seeking in that break? Like, what were you, why, why did you take a, why did you take a break at that stage? Um, so CBS news uh, had made a decision to move. I was running the evening news, the CBS evening news at the time. Um, and they wanted to move the show to Washington. They chose a new anchor and they wanted a new team um, to relaunch the show down there. And I'd spent nine years at CBS in uh, five different roles. I'd come aboard to help launch the morning show with Gail King and Charlie Rose back in the day. I ran streaming, uh, did some startups for them. And they're like, well, you know, we have X, Y, and Z still available. I was like, you know what, I'll take the buyout. This has been a very stressful, I mean, running the evening news is probably the most stressful job I ever had. You know, wow. you're managing 200 people around the world. It's ironic because you're putting together a 30 minute broadcast that after commercials is 21 minutes, but you're, it's a 24 seven job, 
you know, it's like 3 a.m. You get a phone call. I remember like there's been a massacre at a mosque in New Zealand. How do we launch someone? You know, how do we get them there by 6 p.m. Eastern? And you're like globally talking to Beijing and you're talking to the people in Hong Kong and Tokyo and London. And you're like, OK, who gets there first? Is L.A. going to get there? First? You know, it's like you're, you're playing travel agent and running editorial and then managing a lot of personalities, well-paid personalities. Um, and there's just it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, and, you know, it's a, ironic, actually, when I think about it is I was probably furthest from the audience in a role that had the most audience, right? Six or seven million people right. watch the show every night. I had no idea what the audience wants because I'm so caught up in managing internal personalities, the producers, the this, etc. And so I just felt burnt out by the entire thing and felt like, honestly, I was pursuing documentary work. I was like, you know, it'd be fun not having to wake up every day and wait for the whatever's happening, like, let me just dive deep into one topic and produce a, a great documentary every couple of years. So I remember interviewing at those types of places. And I was sort of just, I needed to hit pause and reset. And because honestly, the day to day news in that world and doing that wasn't fulfilling me. And I also felt like we're all going to fall a cliff because ultimately I see the ratings. And if you follow the ratings for cable news and network news right now, today, it's about managing decline. How do you yeah. decline the least? People are going to other alternative platforms. So I felt like in my digital roles at CBS, I got to innovate much more. And that by going to the, you know, the evening news, Walter Cronkite used to anchor and yada, yada, yada. Really cool, really unique, gave me great perspective and great reach. But like that world isn't gonna exist for very long. And so I felt like I need to go do something given that I got 30 years left in my career where I feel like I'm gonna uh, move towards the future. You know, the Wayne Gretzky quote, move, you go to where the puck is going, right? You move with right. the puck. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I want to ask you later about where you where you think the puck is going in, in the world of news, especially like indie news creators like you. You talked about burnout uh, and, uh, you know, now you're running this this startup in the news world and, uh, you know, news is, is, uh, is like nonstop. Um, so, and you tell... Also, part as a part of this, like I'd love to hear about the team. And uh, you know, you started out doing the solo. You mentioned that your your wife said, "Hey, go public instead of being private." And you know, it kind of launched this thing. Um, how have you managed the work life balance doing this? Doing this solo, at least to begin with. Um, it's as any entrepreneur will tell you. It's that it, it itself is a lifestyle. So it's like. But it's a lifestyle that I have found more fulfilling than reporting to a boss who reports to another boss who, you know, tells you, you know, exactly what to do with those five seconds of your show. Um, so there's an autonomy to it. Um, you know, I find myself, you know, it's great to have that check from my wife on like, hey, like, you need to put everything down right now uh, and take care of yourself because sometimes I get caught up in that stuff. But, you know, I think that um, as I'm building this, you know, it does mean that, you know, various, it's a seven day a week job. Now it's not equal time seven days a week, but ultimately it's seven days a week. I'd love to be able to build this into a way where I can have a more traditional, if you say, you know, five day a week role where I actually am able to reset. Now, what's nice about this is I can also take this wherever I'm going. So we can go on a vacation and like, it doesn't, you know, like we were in Charleston on a baby moon uh, recently, um, because my wife is, is due this fall. And that's when the, uh, Pergozin uprising, uh, uh, mutiny was attempted in Russia. And I was like, all right, we're going to head to dinner at this really good dinner, but like on the way in the Uber, I have to post about the mutiny in Russia. Um, so, so <laughs> sure. I'm trying, sure. You know, totally like, it's funny. The like, Uber like, like, like Walter Cronkite, right? Well, like, well, like he, like he did. I mean, I mean, that's how Cronkite did the, the uh, Kennedy assassination in an Uber to Charleston. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that's... I'm still, I, I, I think my answer to that question, short, Rakesh, is TBD, still working on, on the work-life balance, but there's, there's the positives to doing it on the go and, yeah. and having a mobile function. Uh, but there's also the challenges of like, if, you know, trying to make this work, the, the world is, doesn't necessarily work on your, the, the news world never works on your schedule. Yeah. And I, I love the fact that I love the call out that, you know, the lifestyle is fulfilling in terms of like being your own boss and being able to, you know, 
uh, be at the steering wheel and, and steer this, you know, wherever you want to take it, right? And I don't just mean like taking it with you on the road, I mean, deciding what happens and, you know, conducting the experiments, right? That that's invigorating and that's exciting and that's fun, right? I, do, you, do you think that there are enough, uh, you know, independent innovators in the new space? You know, why or why not? Welcome one and all, please. Um, yeah. I, I, I think that um, I did not fully grasp um, where, the, where the traditional media stood with the public until I left the traditional media. Um, and I try to tell that to my former colleagues at traditional media, some of whom are trying to recruit me back into roles at various networks. And I'm like, there's very few jobs, if any, I still want in that world because for a variety of reasons. But I will tell them, you know, you're making a big mistake by not building your own brand, by not building your own presence. Um, I think that we live in the world now where everybody is their own media company right? You're your own media company between your social media accounts and the ability to start a newsletter on Substack and a live stream on YouTube or Twitch or whatever. You're your own media mm -hmm. company. Uh, if you have unique talent, a unique ability to explain something, then leverage that, right? Launch the podcast that does X, Y, Z. Um, now, monetizing that is the challenge in a world of millions of podcasts and millions of newsletters, etc. But if you're right. providing a service, if you have a unique you know, you can tell a good story, you can do, you know, compelling original reporting, then you don't need that three letter network or four letter network, you know, uh, behind you, you can do it on your own. Um, and, I, and I think there's a lot of interesting examples of that, you know, even like my, um, my friend, uh, like uh, Jake Sherman and Anna Palmer, who were at political playbook, and we're like, actually, there's a way to do this where we just devote ourselves to covering Congress, for people who need to know every iteration of Congress. So they launched something called Punchbowl News and it's been hugely successful. Um, and so you can really niche yourself um, in that way. Uh, as far as the creator space is concerned, you know, like on Instagram, there's a, a number of people who do financial explainers really well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a woman named Cleo Abram on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok who does like science and like explains how things work. And she comes from a world at Vox. Vox is an interesting media company that began by just, we're gonna explain the background of things, right? We're gonna take that step back for yep. everybody. Um, and so she's doing that. And there's another woman called the Space Gal um, who does like astronomy explainers, both for kids and for adults of what's happening in the solar system and whatnot and what's happening with NASA. So, you know, I, and, and, I've, and there's another um, person, uh, Sharon McMahon, who's a former government teacher who has a million followers on Instagram um, who launched a podcast. And she started actually just after me because QAnon was frustrating her. And she's like, let me explain government to people. So on a daily basis, she's explaining the basics of government to people. Yeah. Um, and so I think that the ecosystem um, is uh, uh, growing, but it could use more reliable people uh, that are just facts first, because for the most part, it's all opinion makers. A lot of people coming in with an agenda and who aren't necessarily vetting information and data because honestly, that doesn't get you the follows. The OMG, can you believe X happened? Like gets you the follows. And then if it turns out not to be true, they don't really hold themselves to accountable. So I would love people with a journalistic background who, you know, will correct them. So, you know, like there's certain things you learn as tenets of journalism. And that's what's missing from the creator space right now. Yeah, I, I, I have to say like one of the things you bring to your product is your 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 energy and your vibe, which is like a pretty, pretty chill vibe. Like you're, I, I, you know, I think back to what you were saying about, you know, news is like, has to be very authoritative and can't say, I don't know. And, uh, but also the, the cadence with which they talk, right. Has been caricatured because it's, it's ridiculous, right? Like they, they speak in this very Whoa. still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, very you know, what's you know, what's wild Rakesh at CBS, I'd have like, you know, young people in their mid 20s coming in as like new anchors and I'm like why are you talking like that and I'm realizing that like journalism <laughs> schools are training people for a bygone era and I've spoken at several journalism schools where I was like what how are you training the is TikTok storytelling they're like well we're not I'm like wake up like you like you're you're training people for an era that doesn't exist anymore or is dying and yeah. so ultimately you need to be conversational and this is a big thing too like I did an explainer yesterday on the on the premium account actually you know, people are like, what, what's the Hunter Biden thing all about? I'm like, you know, one thing that most media companies won't tell you is like, they screwed up 2020. 
they bought the Biden line. And what what Republicans are telling you, not necessarily like all true. What the Biden people told you, not necessarily all true. The truth, typically, we live in shades of gray in this world. It's somewhere in the middle. But I think being able to have an open and honest conversation where it's like, no, you know what, we screwed that up. We should hold ourselves accountable. Whereas in the media, it's like, oh, you know, like even this recent um, example of the, the CNN president, uh, Chris Licht, um, losing his job. And in that profile, I think one thing that came out, um, you know, that infamous profile is uh, he had said, you know, I feel like, you know, we need to own up to our COVID coverage. You know, like we necessarily, you know, that there are things that we, you know, need to think about and reassess. And there's a knee jerk at many people in the companies to be like, what do you mean? We did great at X, Y, and Z. It's like, no, in the same way that journalists hold everyone else accountable, we got to hold ourselves accountable. We need to have our own admissions of whatever. How do we get better? The only way that we can grow an audience and grow a foundation and grow trust is we have to admit um, when we may have missed something or may have you know bought something that wasn't true. And so I think that you know like having just admitting like and I know that doesn't necessarily work for certain politicians these days, but I think in journalism. Yeah. Uh, have, being absolute, being like, we always get, you know, whatever. It's like, the, you know, it's incredible. I think somebody noted recently, like the role of an ombudsman. An ombudsman is what many newspapers used to have, somebody who was self-critical of the newspaper and they would have like a right. weekly column being like, here are our hits and misses, folks. Here's the good, bad, and ugly, what we did this week. I don't know any institute, like many institutions that have that role anymore. And I think that would be so valuable for media companies. And I think honestly, it would earn trust being like, you know what I like that every week they, Talk about what they messed up or what they missed. At what point does uh, Mo News become too big? Like that, that, you know, you can't keep doing what you're doing. Is there a break point? You know, you're started at, at 100 or 500. And now you're at 500,000. You know, what's the, what, what is, what is the point at which, you know, something's got to change? You think? I, I, well, I mean, I, honestly, it's it's about growing to the audience, right? Like, it, it's it's not at the point anymore where like Mosh by himself can do all of this and mm. ensure that there's a podcast every day and ensure that there's a newsletter every day. So we, you know, we've grown the team. So we have an audio editor who, okay. you know, handles the podcast, and then I have a co-host, um, Jill, who. Uh, you know, contributes to the newsletter, edits the newsletter, and co-hosts the podcast with me. I have a video video editor, Khalid, who uh, edits our video. Um, I'm sitting in a room right now with uh, two of our summer interns uh, who are contributing. I have a producer who just devotes herself to Instagram. Um, and so, you know, I, the next step for me, frankly, is to hire someone on the business end uh, to help with, uh, you know, marketing, growth, sales, partnerships, etc. cetera. Um, and so the only limit there is the bootstrapping nature. If I took outside money, I could probably, you know, hire and scale quickly. But I think that's where we're at. You know, it's a good problem to have, like yeah. being too big. I'm not there yet. Um, the one thing I never want to lose, though, is the voice of what we do and staying in touch with the audience. And I feel like that's something that's always a concern when you have a startup, that when, you, when it grows, it's not what it was. Um, and sometimes that's been my fear of taking outside money uh, and finding the right investors is I want to ensure that they don't end up dictating the direction that's at, um, you know, cross purposes with the voice and the initial goal of the of the institution. Yeah, I really like the fact that you're growing it organically, right? It means that you're you're having to make the money before you spend the money. And uh, and so, you know, that's that's going to force a discipline on the way that you make investments versus potentially, you know, growing too fast or, you know, hiring somebody before you really need to hire someone, right? There's, there's a real benefit. There's a discipline that comes with growing organically. One of the um, early followers of the Instagram account was Barbara Corcoran, who you might know from Shark Tank, oh, you know, who yeah. sold her business. So she, Barbara had me on her podcast. I've had her on my podcast. And one thing she said to me, when I was on her podcast is, mm. you know, that she believes in her time at Shark Tank, et cetera, is that the, some of the best products, the best companies have come from situations where they aren't given $20 million to go spend, that they yeah. actually have to look at their ledger every month and say, are we going to be able to make it? Um, that you're much smarter with what you're investing in and how you're investing in it when there's not an unlimited supply of money coming your way. And it's funny because 
I had just spoken to, you know, one, my last consulting project before I launched Mo News um, was Quibi. I was helping Condé Nast um, launch video shows for Quibi, a short lived attempt at a short form video, the Netflix for short form video. Um, and Quibi spent upwards of a billion dollars uh, on something yeah. that lasted less than six months. Yeah, we got some of those dollars. Uh, there, there were <laughs> all of the news shows on Quibi were using Snapstream for their for go. their clips. Uh, so, you know, we were <laughs> we were some sort of a beneficiary. Uh, didn't didn't but, help our our churn uh, numbers. Well, I was going to say a lot of uh, a lot of media organizations, you know, like have a have a, got a nice little boost from Quibi in the year twenty twenty. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, talking about platforms, uh, you mentioned, you know, you you. You know, you've jumped on TikTok, and you're 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 also out on. Uh, uh, you have a podcast, and you distribute that podcast, and you monetize the podcast. Um, what uh, you know? What are some of like the non-obvious lessons you've learned about the different platforms? You also mentioned, I think, that Instagram is hard to monetize. It's very, it's you know, it's difficult for to, news. I mean, some people news, are making seven, eight figures off of Instagram. So sure. I I want to be very specific there. Um, I think that you know, like if I was doing fashion cosmetics, nutri you know, there's certain elements there. Um, at the same time, though, you know, I think it's gradually growing. It's a matter of finding also brands that uh, embrace, um, you know, embrace what you're doing and also embrace those platforms. You know, something I've discovered in this world is like, I'll often, you know, like I have a sponsorship with a certain brand. And I actually talked to two completely different departments for their um, Instagram ads and for their podcast ads. For mm. one, they have an outside agency. For one, they go internal. And they don't talk to each other. In fact, I was like, can I have the same code, discount code for both? They're like, no, your Instagram code is this, your podcast code. And so it's interesting because even, you know, the, the, the brands themselves, the agencies themselves have to figure out this space. Um, and so, you know, at our core, you know, I think there's three core things we're doing right now, which is Instagram, which is our top of our funnel, um, podcast and newsletter. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, it's like, how do we grow on YouTube and TikTok? YouTube, because it is the video platform, it is the search platform, um, it is incredibly large. Um, so how do we build content that'll work there? And TikTok yeah. mainly because of just the, it's the last social platform where you could have massive growth. Um, you know, some people get a million TikTok followers off of one video, right? And right. so I think it's a mistake to ignore that. Um, and, but then of course, like, you know, you have Twitter, AKA X, right. Um, you have threads. I mean, there's a bunch of others. And I think the decision we have to make is, is it, and then of course there's a link, you know, I shouldn't ignore LinkedIn and Facebook there, but then you're like, I'm a startup trying to build nine great platforms, like on nine different, like, I can't do that. Like that's not yeah. even, you know, that is very challenging and to do it well, you have to customize the content for those platforms, um, and play to each of those platforms. So I think right. that. You know, that's the question is not to ignore stuff. I feel like, you know, you, you if you watch like Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk video, he's always like, get on this, you got to get on this, you got to like, right. um, and, uh, you know, I think that we're going to try to be quick to uh, embrace new platforms, knowing that nine out of 10 of them might not survive long term, and 10 out of 10 of them might not be monetizable. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of um, what works best. Uh, and I think that's where being small allows us to be agile and you know constantly reassessing you know every couple months like are we devoting the right amount of time and resources to the various platforms so top of the funnel is instagram podcasts and newsletter you said yeah. uh right that's the mo premium is essentially it, so uh podcast is free daily the newsletter is yes. free daily the instagram is free daily and then uh each of them have a premium offering so gotcha. you get extra, yeah. like beyond the daily offering, you get, you know, you get a, a separate Instagram account, uh, a separate podcast, and then, you know, in the newsletter space, we'll be offering extra newsletters to the subscribers. Got it. And, and uh, what do you use for, for the premium uh, subscription management piece? Is that's not a sub stack or, or no, you're just using. We, we decided to go independent. So a couple of the platforms right. we're using, we're using Memberful. Um, Memberful. Memberful for our uh, premium offering. Memberful is backed up by Stripe. Um, we built a website that's partially Squarespace, partially WordPress, because mm. WordPress plugs into Memberful. We had to use Zapier as a link between the two. I mean, you, as you know, like the tech stack 
is always challenging with all of these. So yeah. uh, memberful for that subscription piece um, and then the various stuff for the website. Uh, and then hopefully between all of that, that'll enable us to build out our courses um, on the website and, and really kind of launch a, a 2.0 of the website, which we hope to do in the coming months. Wow, that's, uh, that's awesome. So, and, and by doing that, I mean, one, you have the flexibility to, you know, maybe, you know, do some things that say uh, Substack wouldn't let you do or do doesn't have the capabilities for so you can perhaps innovate. And then, then you also save, you know, the VIG, whatever the percentage is that they take, you know, I don't, I don't I haven't kept up with it. There's a percentage that everybody takes. Memberful takes a take, you know, Stripe takes a, a cut, you know, like they, that's sure. the challenge with any of these. By the way, our newsletter we've launched on Beehive. Um, oh, right. So Beehive uh, was founded by a co-founder of Morning Brew. Uh, so mm -hmm. we're actually using Beehive as the back end to our newsletter. Um, and so, you know, each of these have, have their challenges. One of the lessons I learned, and we didn't go into this, I was part of the Facebook bulletin experiment. So for a quick moment in time, Mark Zuckerberg wanted to create a Substack competitor. They called it Bulletin. And they brought over a whole bunch of writers. They paid a bunch of us to, you know, an annual deal to launch our newsletters on Bulletin, which for a quick second, they were devoting resources to. And then as part of all the meta cuts of last fall, they completely killed. Um, mm. But you had like Malcolm Gladwell, Ian Bremmer, um, mm. I, I, Malala Yousafzai, like, you know, if you look at the assortment, Mitch Album, the assortment of people they had, Adam Grant um, on Bulletin, it was mm. actually like a pretty, pretty compelling lineup of creators as a competitor to Substack and they killed it. And I was like, you know what, honestly, after going through that and going through a couple of these, I need to just build my own thing because like being wedded to a, a closed orbit platform is challenging. And by the way, it's an admission on Instagram. Like that's why I'm building the website and the newsletter and the podcast is because yeah. you better own your audience on those platforms. On social media, you're at the whim of those platforms. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's like you own the field versus sharecropping, right? I mean, you're... Yeah. You know that you're you're in, you know that you're doing that when you're on Instagram, like you're building on somebody else's platform, but then you have your own platform where you're basically you know getting people over to hopefully over time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you know it's 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 great. And by the way, I'm talking to you from our new WeWork offices because we have an annual WeWork partnership. So WeWork is a kind of deal with us where you know we're providing them Instagram and, and podcast ads in exchange for an office. Like I have an eight person office here at WeWork in Brooklyn. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to be creative with, with partnerships that both make sense for our audience, make sense for the partner. Uh, and also as we're a startup, like serve a, serve a purpose for the startup. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. So what's next? What's on the, what's on the roadmap? We talked about some of them. You talked about courses and, and may, maybe another way to ask the question, what is your, where, where is your learning edge right now? What do you, what, what is it that like you're experimenting with, or you're learning about, or you're curious about in not like in world news, uh, but in the building of this business? Well, I mean, one thing we talked about it briefly before we got started here is AI. Um, how do we embrace AI? And I think that's a larger conversation right now across the media spectrum. And it's funny because news media tend to be late adopters mm. on certain technologies. Um, and by the way, it's, it's what, like some of the core issues media is facing today is the lack of understanding it had for the internet for the first, I don't know, 15 years of the internet. Um, I mean, there's uh, a lot of examples there we could dive into. And so, you know, I want to ensure that, uh, you know, I'm figuring out how I can utilize the chat GPTs and the BARDs and the various AI things that are happening. You know, one thing that we've started to look at in the past couple of weeks is something called Opus, O-P-U-S, um, cool. as a, a video AI, which allows us to literally throw the entire video podcast into Opus. And Opus comes back with um, uh, vertical uh, video clips that we can socialize out, uh, which allows us to, again, you know, be efficient, put out content, um, utilizing AI. So that's a leading, you know, that's something that I'm particularly interested in. I don't want to get left behind there. I want to, you know, also figure out best practices uh, when it comes to some of these technologies. Uh, at our core, you know, I want to ensure um, that we're also innovating for the biggest story in, in America for the next 16 months, which is an election. How do I tell that story? How do I cover that story um, in a way that makes sense for the audience um, and in a way that the audience is consuming it? Because I feel like the way that um, some of the old places I work at are still covering elections 
in the same way they did, and by the way, there's certain things you don't change, but in the same way they did in the 16 cycle, the 12 cycle, the 08 cycle, the 04 cycle, and it's like, well, are there new ways we should be thinking about this? Um, you know, how do we hit reset on this that doesn't just involve like bigger screens and graphics behind us, which I feel like is the knee jerk for a lot of TV networks. So I want to ensure that as we think about the growth that we're gearing the growth around this, uh, again, the core offering, um, and that we can, you know, be as effective and provide, um, answer the, the questions and provide the content that fills the gaps uh, and ensures that is it, it's getting at answering the questions people have. What what do you what any any thoughts on the next election in terms of how you're going to cover it? Like you know any anything that you uh, you're you have like okay this is this is what I think we're going to do next or how we're going to innovate. So we're building out kind of a deep dive, get to know the candidates. Uh, and by the way, that's probably going to exist on traditional media as well. But that's something that you know I'm asked about is like tell me about in your Tim voice, Scott. right? Yeah, in in my voice. Let me you know let me do an interesting text video combo. Um, diving into each of the candidates. I feel like there's generally, um, and I'm certainly guilty of this in my previous life and even my current life as well, a dismissal of certain candidates or well, they have no shot anyway. Well, you know what? People want to know about what's happening with RFK. The number of questions I still get about like Marianne Williamson or uh, Vivek sure. Ramaswamy, you know, like, and again, having covered By some way, of these I, elections. I, I knew exactly who you were talking about when you said uh, I tend to dismiss candidates and you said then <laughs> you followed it with RFK. <laughs> but that's the thing, you know, like, yeah, no, you, it you is. know, yeah. I, I, he's a he's a fascinating character. And by the way, like when I go into the family history, people are fascinated by the family history of the Kennedys and Grandpa Kennedy, you know, Joe Kennedy and his dad. And like the fact that, like, as we talk about bias, the DOJ, you're like, you know, his dad was his brother's attorney general. Do you think that would fly in this day and age? So anyway, I think people are fascinated by the history um, of that. So I think that's one way we'll be approaching the election is just like, you know, again, just kind of just the facts, et cetera. One thing that I think I uniquely am able to provide, Rakesh, is also how the media covers these things, breaking yeah. down that wall for people. You know, like mm. I've done some stuff on the decision desk and how networks make calls um, and how networks do polling. and not a day goes by without a question about like, wait, how can we tell what's happening in the country with 2000 people? So I had the gal, the head of Gallup on recently on the podcast. Um, and I think we'll continue to do that. But there's there's some core things that we still to this day in traditional media don't necessarily explain to people, but we just we mention all the time and people have some real fundamental questions about not in a in a bad way, like, you're, you know, but in a in a curious way. Um, and I think that's that's important to explain. So I think that's one thing that you will uniquely be able to provide. The question is format and how we do it. And that's something we're figuring out. Yeah, it, it occurred to me just now as uh, as we're having this conversation, you are the product. You, you Mosh is the is the product of of Mosh News, right? I mean, you're that's what people are coming for is uh, is for for your voice and uh, for your your take and your your all of what you described. Um, you know, and I think it's really great how you've taken that and, you know, experimented and, and figured out a model um, that, you know, it's going to allow you to turn this into something that continues to grow and, and uh, is hopefully a more and more essential part of the news ecosystem. So, uh, so I absolutely love it. Well, I, I appreciate uh, you having me on. I appreciate the partnership we have with Snapstream and, and you giving us access to the, um, the, treasure trove of live video uh, that um, allows us to stay on top of the news. In fact, we're about an hour away from a Trump arraignment as we talk here. So uh, we'll be tuned in um, to all the various channels you provide. And this so, is but, a webinar host uh, uh, overlord coming in over the loudspeakers here. This is Brennan. Hello. Uh, I want to really quick point out two questions, uh, really super brief Q&A at the end here for everybody. Um, First, from Daniel Me, uh, really, really quick, wanted to ask about how much of a problem is it for news creators to be dependent on platforms like Patreon? I think you guys kind of just came right back to that just now. I, listen, I think that um, the challenge uh, creators have right now is like the core thing, which is can I make a living between subscribers and advertising? Um, and 
the ecosystem is still developing. Uh, and like, you know, you, I went through basically like, I got to use Memberful, which, you know, uses Stripe, and then I have to go through a website and connect all that stuff. So it requires a technical expertise that many content creators don't have. So you can go to a Patreon, which is good. <clears throat> I think that like, you know, I've joked with some uh, media colleagues who are also figuring out this new world about like a confederation of sorts, like, you know, creating some sort of creator communities where we can all help each other out. And then, you know, you can then sell scale among a bunch of creators. I think an interesting example of that is Puck News, P-U-C-K, if you've heard of them, where uh, ex Vandy Fair um, editor has created that with a number of writers, uh, you know, someone who covers foreign policy, someone who covers politics, someone who covers business, uh, and, you know, it's figuring that out. So it's, you know, it's, un it's unfortunate that, um, it, you know, re good reporters out there, good journalists who are covering important stories, are struggling to make a living and have to go into public relations. No, not dismissing public relations, but that's often the route for journalists who want a reliable income uh, and tend to be good communicators. And so, you know, I think that uh, thankfully there's, you know, some people are making good livings off of Substack, some people are making good livings off of podcasts. I mean, there's a lot of these platforms, but, uh, you know, uh, there's also a lot of people who are struggling on those platforms. And so, if there's a way to, you know, I, I, I think we're winging it right now. We're all figuring it out. That's been part of this conversation. Yeah, for Amen. what it's worth, for what it's worth, Moshe, I, I think that uh, part of the future, your future lies in maybe a puck-like model, right? I mean, I think that, you know, eventually there's probably other, other personalities that sit alongside you that, you know, you are the umbrella for and, uh, you know, Hey, you know, and there's an argument to be made, like, why would they need you? Like, why don't they just, you know, go direct to their own audiences, right? But, uh, but yeah, I think there's probably something to be gained, you know, for there to be other faces who all have their own personalities, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I, some of the creators I even mentioned, like, if, if I could sell you a package, and you know, with that subscription, you're gonna get extra content on science, you know, like, you know, an interesting model of this is like the athletic too. you know, the athletic was like, I'm going to customize your sports coverage based on the teams that you care about. And then New York Times bought it for several hundred million dollars. Right. And so, you know, I, I think if we create a confederation of, of reliable content creators in various sectors, there could be something interesting there. You know, I, I think the, the, there's a lot of opportunities uh, in this space. Yeah. Love it. Um, Brandon, there's another question. Yeah, Mel Olinsky on YouTube says, Hi, no. Mosh. I, I missed the beginning of your talk. I'm curious, where are you getting a uh, video for Mo News, which you kind of plugged at the end there? <laughs> um, and, and she also says, Hi, Rakesh. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, listen, we, we spend, and I, there's no one better at this than Overlord Brennan, by the way, at scouring the internet for, um, you know, compelling video clips out there. The only thing that limits us is frankly, um, time and, and personnel uh, to find compelling video. And the fact that like so much great video has never been digitized. Um, but, you know, Stapstream for our, our news content, uh, for archival stuff, you know, we'll rely on, um, uh, you know, various media organizations. Uh, you know, it was interesting when we were covering the Titanic, uh, you know, the, the boat that went, the sub, uh, submersible that went down the Titanic, you know, one of the most uh, compelling clips was one from CBC radio uh, of the uh, founder giving a tour of the submersible. Um, and so, you know, scarring YouTube, scarring Twitter uh, and uh, and the internet for this stuff. Uh, and then, you know, as far as the, the breaking news stuff, that's Snapstream. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, that's one of the challenges I'd imagine being an independent news organization. You don't have you know, a, an AP feed or a Reuters feed, et cetera, right? Like where you're, you're pulling on these, like, you know, frankly, very expensive uh, wire services. That's the challenge. Um, and, but I think as we grow, we'll have to figure out, like, you know, we just got a subscription to a, a photo service because of the newsletter. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, take, take very seriously rights and clearances, et cetera. And so I think that, you know, that's important, but these things are very costly. So, we're, uh, we're navigating um, uh, as we can. There's also a, a former NBC producer uh, who started a company called TMX, um, which is mm -hmm. in the business of clearing, um, clearing video. Um, and so, you know, there's a few affordable entities out there uh, to access good video. Yeah. 
Awesome. Hey, Mosh, thanks a lot. Uh, this is awesome. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks, Rakesh. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody.